I'd like to welcome everyone to the workshop, and I would also like to thank the speakers for uh, agreeing to um, uh, give us talks on a number of uh, very interesting topics. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Shruti Puri uh, from Yale University, and she is going to tell us uh, about how to build a reliable quantum computer from unreliable parts. So Shruti, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, firstly, thank you for the, this invitation. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, tell you some of the work uh, we have been doing. Uh, so I hope we can all see the slides. Please interrupt me if the, you can't hear me or can't see, see the slides or something. Um, and during the talk, I'll try to uh, like pause at places and see if there are any questions. And uh, yeah, so you can, you know, Feel free to ask me questions. And my aim is not to like rush through all the slides. I, I hope that you get something out of it rather than just me, you know, flooding you with information. Okay, so today I, I want to tell you a bit about the area of quantum computing that I'm most uh, interested in uh, as a theorist, which is quantum error correction, fault tolerant qu quantum error correction in which we deal with uh, faulty quantum devices and, and building reliable, uh, you know, high precision quantum computers out of, of unreliable parts. Um, so in, in the, so firstly, why, why do I care about quantum computing? Well, there are some uh, problems which are classically easy to solve, such as multiplication. By easy, I mean that uh, if you, uh, as the size of the problem increases, the, the complexity or the time it takes to solve the problem increase, increases only polynomially. And then there are some problems which are uh, easy to solve on a quantum computer, but are hard to solve on a classical computer, such as factorization. So we know this from Shor's factorization algorithm that you can, you can solve it in polynomial time uh, on a quantum computer. But there are going to be some problems uh, which are going to be hard to solve even on a, a quantum computer and a classical computer, such as finding, you know, the ground states or ground state energies of, uh, com com uh, you know, very, very complex interacting fermionic or bosonic systems. So there's a lot of work going on in, uh, in, in quantum algorithms, which deals with finding problems and finding algorithms to solve problems in, in, in these, uh, you know, different complexity classes. And so far we know of very few uh, problems where you can actually achieve a quantum speed up. That is, you know that it's going to be much more efficient to solve a problem with a quantum computer than a classical computer. So if you're interested, there's this, you know, kind of famous uh, uh, link you can go to and, and they list, you know, all of, all of the known algorithms uh, and, and their complexity, it, 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 all the, the quantum algor algorithms and their quantum complexities. So one of the important milestones that you know, we want to reach to be even able to attempt to implement any of these algorithms is um, building a fault tolerant quantum memory um, or it, that is that you, you need to build a quantum system which survives where the quantum information survives for a time longer than the lifetime of each of the constituents. And this is the area of fault tolerant quantum computation. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to split the talk into two parts. I'm gonna start with the basics um, because you know, there's a wide uh, a range of audience. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, uh, superconducting circuits and, and how we, we do, uh, how we build qubits in superconducting circuits. Um, so to understand most of my talk, you don't really need to know uh, how these systems work, but I'm going to show you some examples, some experimental results, which were uh, you know, achieved in the superconducting circuits. And so you know, just in the beginning, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Then I'm going to introduce uh, error correction, fault tolerance, and tell you a little bit about the most famous uh, error correcting code out there, which is the topological surface code. And then in the second part, I'll tell you a bit more about how we envision building qubits uh, and error correction in Yale. And uh, this is the area of uh, bosonic error correction. Okay, so let's start with the first part. Uh, as you know, in, in classical computation, we store information in this uh, state of a bit, which can be zero or one. In quantum computation, we, we store a quantum bit in the superposition states of two orthogonal states of a system. So this can be a superposition like a ket zero plus b ket one and zero and one could be some, you know, some, some state, some uh, 
two-dimensional Hilbert space of some system. Um, so we can represent the dynamics of this qubit on the block sphere. So the state of your qubit can be along the z-axis of the block sphere, so that it can be zero or one, or it can be along the x-axis of the block sphere, which is a superposition, even an odd superpositions of zeros and ones. And then you can be along the y-axis, which is this other superposition states. So when we think about a, a quantum bit, you might you know, think about the state of an electron in an atom. And if it's in the one energy state, we call it uh, the state, uh, the ket zero state. And uh, if it's another energy state, we call it the ket one state. Now, of course, we want to prepare any superposition state of a single quantum bit. We also want to entangle these uh, uh, multiple uh, qubits together. And we want to perform two qubit gates and so on. So what one could imagine doing is like put this uh, atom in an optical cavity. So your atom interacts with some, you know, we have some dipole coupling with the field inside the cavity, you have some losses and you can apply some uh, field, optical field to the system. And then uh, because of this coupling, you can you know, perform uh, unitary gate operations on your, uh, on your qubit. So you can move it anywhere along the block sphere. So now in superconducting circuits, uh, the atom is replaced by a superconducting Josephson injunction and the optical cavity is replaced by a microwave cavity. So here I'm, I'm showing you an example of a, a 3D aluminum cavity and the Josephson junction is this uh, aluminum aluminum oxide aluminum uh, sandwich, uh, which, is, which is going to be our artificial atom. And then you apply microwave, uh, 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 microwave drives to control, uh, just like here you apply optical drives, here you apply microwave drives to control the state of your qubit or the Josephson injunction. Um, so if you, Sorry, I cannot see a part of my screen. Yeah, so the, the represent, uh, so I'm going to use this um, representation, uh, the cartoon representation of the Josephson junction shown on the side here. Um, so the next, uh, so if I want to model the, the cavity itself, the cavity is a harmonic oscillator. So it has the eigenstates are, you know, you can think about it as uh, Fox states. Uh, Fox state zero, which is a vacuum state, Fox state one, which is a one photon Fox state and so on and so forth. And because it's a harmonic oscillator, all these energy states are equally separated from each other by some frequency, say omega r. And in superconducting circuits, this frequency is about, it's like few gigahertz. Um, now, uh, if, if, you, if you now look at the um, uh, Hamiltonian for this, just when, you, when you put this Joseon junction, then the Hamiltonian actually becomes like that of a anharmonic oscillator. So now, um, yeah, so now the Hamiltonian is given here. So you have the frequency term and the, uh, the second term is a nonlinearity, which comes from the Joseon junction. Uh, and what, it, what this nonlinearity does is uh, it it, it just induces a photon a number dependent frequency shift. So basically, uh, it doesn't do anything to the zero and one Fox states, but it'll change the uh, frequencies of the Fox state two, Fox state three, and so on. And so now these energies are no longer equidistant from each other. Um, so you can now selectively apply a drive and manipulate the state of your atom within this, uh, within this the two, two lowest energy states, and that will be my qubit subspace. Um, and you can, uh, so th this atom is also, you know, just like in this optical cavity, there's some coupling between this atom and the, the uh, electromagnetic fields in this uh, uh, 3D cavity, uh, which can be about 100 megahertz. The nonlinearities that we can get is about, you know, several hundred, mega, um, se several hundred megahertz. And the frequency range, uh, as I mentioned before, was about a few gigahertz. Uh, so, 10 gigahertz is about 0 0.5 Kelvin. So you have to operate these circuits at uh, in a dilution fridge temperatures of a few millikelvin uh, to be able to do coherent uh, operations so that you're not, uh, you know, basically your qubit is not killed by thermal excitations. Okay, so now we are going to talk about quantum error correction uh, in this system. So let's look at what are quantum errors that we care about. So you can, you can write any, um, uh, you can decompose any type of qu a single qubit quantum error as a combination of bit flips, phase flips, and wire. So bit flip is like the action of an X operator on your state. So it flips zero to one and one to zero. 
uh, the phase flip is like the action of Pauli Z operator on your state. So it just puts a phase difference between the zero and one state. So you lose the phase information. And the Y error is like the action of both X and Y operators. So you can, that means that you're not only uh, making a bit flip, but you're also messing up the phase information. Of course, you can also have continuous errors in this case. Um, so you can have errors like this, where P is just some poly operator X, Y, or Z. So our aim is going to be able to correct for all of these errors. Um, so in, let's, let's look at what are the uh, error probabilities or what is the error rate that we can reach in, uh, in our uh, superconducting circuit. So here I've, I've picked out some numbers from literature uh, for different types of um, uh, superconducting qubits out there. So I've given the examples of the 2D transmon, 3D transmon, the Xmon, which Google uses. And um, this is here, um, this is the work from Yale in which we store information in, in the cavities directly rather than the, the Joseon junction, but I'm gonna come to that in a second. Uh, so basically, if you look at uh, the T1, T2 times, which is the decoherence time, so you can basically think about this as, so these, these uh, times determine how fast or what is the probability of an X, Y, or Z errors. So you know, here are some examples. These are in the range of uh, 10 to a few hundred microseconds, but the single qubit and two qubit gate times are much shorter, if you, you know, 10 to 100 uh, nanoseconds. And so you can reach uh, pretty uh, low uh, error probabilities. So what? So let's look at this number. What this number means is that you'll get, if you try to do this gate thousand times, you'll get one uh, gate. You, you'll do it wrong one time. Um, so you see, we can we can reach pretty low error rates, but the question is, is this enough to do any useful quantum computation? So what do I mean by useful quantum computation? So say I want to factorize a 2000 bit number or find some ground state um, of some molecule. Uh, here I'm giving the example of Fimoco, which is used as a um, catalyst in, for, uh, in making fertilizers and in, in nitrogen fixation, nitrogen fixation for making fertilizers. Uh, so here I'm also listing, you know, the number of qubits you require to run these algorithms, the number of gates. So you, you need really, really large number of gates. And so now you would want, because you need to do so many gates, the probability of uh, error has to be smaller than one over the number of gates, uh, basically. So you, you don't want, you, you, you run a circuit 10 to the 11 times, but you don't want any error to happen within uh, in, in 10 to the 11 times that you apply any gate. So the error rate in this case has to be really small, like 10 to the minus 12, or in the case of the Fomoco molecule, about 10 to the minus 16. So clearly, if you're orders of magnitude away uh, from you know, going from a physical, say, superconducting qubit uh, to, a, uh, to what we need for uh, implementing these algorithms. And therefore, we need some uh, active error correction uh, to, uh, you know, to reach these low error rates. So, before talking about quantum error corrections, let's quickly go over the classical error correction. So in classical error correction, information is stored in bits, which can be zero or one, and the errors can flip you from uh, flip you between the zero and one states. So in uh, classical error correction, the easiest way to think about it is just repeat your information. So you uh, encode a single bit of information zero into the state of many physical bits, which are all in the zero state and the, uh, and the bit one is stored in the state of many physical bits all in the one state. So if few of these bits flip, then you know the zero state might go to this state and the one state might go to this state. So now what we can do is we can go and measure each bit independently and see uh, whether its state is zero and one and we can just take a majority word. Um, so if the probability of a bit flip error you know, is small, you know, smaller, like, smaller than 50%, pretty much then uh, you, your majority vote will be successful. That is, you, you'll say that most of the time, um, so if, if, if you measure each bit, uh, if you see most of the bit in the state zeros, you, you'll predict that the, the starting state was actually the all zero state. And if, if you find most of the uh, bits to be in the state one, you'll say that um, starting state was the all one state. Um, 
so again, if the probability of, of a bit flip error is small, then this decoding is going to be successful. And you know, this is how you could imagine doing a simple classical error correction code. Now, if you blindly follow uh, a classical error correction, then, you, then now we want to predict an unknown quantum state. So we want to predict the superposition of zero and one where we don't know what this value of X and Y is. Um, so if you want to do that, if, if, it, and if I follow the classical error correction blindly, then I, I, I would try to copy the state into the three physical state, uh, into, the, into the state of three physical qubits. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not allowed due to the no cloning theorem. Moreover, I cannot even go and measure each, the, the state of each qubit because, you know, we know measurements destroy the superpositions. Um, and so we can't directly measure the state as well. Moreover, we don't want to just correct for you know, discrete errors. We also want to be able to correct for continuous errors. So how does uh, quantum error correction work when we have the no cloning theorem, the measurement postulate, and we have continuous errors? Fortunately, it still works. Uh, otherwise, I won't be giving you a talk about it. So let me uh, very quickly explain um, uh, you know, a simple uh, quantum error correcting code, which is a quantum repetition code, which will correct for bit flip uh, kind of an error. So the idea for building a quantum code is going to be that we don't, uh, we don't copy, but we'll entangle the states. So to give you an example, we'll take three physical qubits and call the logical zero state to be the state zero, zero, zero of the three physical qubits and the logical one state to be the one, one state of the three physical qubits. So the superposition state becomes this entangled state. This is allowed. The no cloning theorem doesn't uh, forbid this from happening. Okay, so first step, uh, encode the uh, information cleverly and you know any superposition state will actually look like some entangled state of the system. Now we don't want to measure you know, the state of each qubit because we know uh, we can collapse uh, the state. So what we'll do is we want to measure the correlations between qubits to determine if there was an error or not. So suppose there was a bit flip error in the second qubit. So the zero will flip to one and the one will flip to zero. So now what we'll do is we'll ask whether the first two qubits are same or different and whether the second two qubits are same or different. You see, if the first, if there's no error, then the first two qubits would be the same. But if there's an error, then the first two qubits are going to be different. And similarly for the second two qubits. So now if we measure these correlations, that is we measure this operator ZZI between the first two qubits and Z, IZZ, so the ZZ between the next two qubits. If I measure these two, then if there was no error, I'll get the state plus one. And if there was an error, so if there was no error, I'll get the, the my measurement outcome will be plus one with probability one in both the two cases. But if there was an error, then the measurement probability, so the measurement outcome will be minus one in both the two cases. And similarly, uh, if there was a bit flip error in the first qubit, when I make, make these measurements, this will be minus one plus one. And if there was a bit flip error in the last qubit, the um, measurement results will be plus one and minus one. So now I can use this information, I can use this table basically, and use these measurement outcomes to de determine if there was an error uh, in, the, in the qubit or error in my, if there was a single bit flip error in my system or not and correct it. Uh, so this is an example of a, a three qubit repetition code that I gave here, which corrects for one bit flip error. If there were two bit flip errors, then we would not be able to do this trick. Um, so in general, I can make an n qubit repetition code, which can correct for n minus uh, one over two bit flip errors. So if you look at the, just the three qubit uh, uh, bit flip code, then the probability of a failure is the probability that two errors happen and the probability that three errors happen. And this is smaller, uh, and here px is the probability there's, that there was one bit flip error. Uh, so this, this probability of failure of this code now is going to be smaller than px itself. Um, and so we, that means that, of course, px has to be smaller than one for this to happen. And um, when this, because of, because of this, um, because, because the probability of logical error rate is smaller than uh, just the physical failure rate of px, we have successfully done error correction. In general, for a n qubit repetition code, 
uh, this is the probability of a, a logical error rate and you can um, for, for large n you can approximate the formula in this manner and you can now immediately see then as long as px is smaller than half then this quantity will be less than one that means that just by increasing the size of the code i can decrease the logical error rate as small as i want but if px is greater than one then this quantity is greater than one and by increasing the size of the code i'm actually making errors worse so this value of px equal to half or 50% is called the threshold. Below the threshold, my error correction is going to be successful. Above the threshold, my error correction is going to fail. So the, this, 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 uh, the threshold for a quantum code is a very important um, number. And the higher the threshold, the better your code is. And the quantities that we measure to detect for errors are called as stabilizers. Uh, so now the question is, how am I going to correct for continuous errors? So say, say in the example of my repetition code, say the error was e to the i theta x one, uh, that is a bit, x one is the poly x operator of the first qubit. Then I can simplify this to be, uh, and write it as cos theta times a state which has no error plus sine theta times a state which has one error on the first qubit. Now, if I again measure my stabilizers like I was doing in the, uh, in the previous slide, then either I'm going to measure myself in the no error state or the error state. So if I measure, if my measurement outcome is plus one plus one, then and then my state, then this superposition state is automatically projected onto the no error state. And I know that it was projected onto the no error state because I got the outcome as plus one plus one. Uh, so there's no need for me to do any error correction. But if I actually measured this, uh, the stabilizers to be minus one and plus one, that means there, there was an error and I automatically project myself onto this error uh, state. And now I know that uh, that error happened, I can look go back and look up my uh, table and de determine that the error actually happened on the first qubit and I can apply uh, a correction to it. So in this way, basically the idea is that uh, continuous, if you're able to uh, correct correct for discrete errors, then you'll be able to correct for superpositions of those discrete errors because your measurements will, uh, will basically reduce continuous errors to discrete errors. So if you have a code which can correct for X, Y, and, and Z errors, then you can also correct for any superposition of those errors. So I can, um, maybe I can just stop for a second and see if there are any questions. There is one question on the chat. It says, can you please repeat the distinction between logical error probability and the original bit flip error probability? Right. So the logical, so basically the logical error probability is like my, that, that what is the probability that uh, there's an error in that entangled state that I'm getting versus the physical error rate. Like if I did not, if I did not make that three qubit code and I just used one qubit and I, and I made any superposition state of X zero plus Y one, then the probability that you know, that there'll be an error on that state is the same as the probability that there's a bit flip error with the probability px. But now when I make this entangled state, uh, x0 zero, zero plus y11, one, one, and if I do error correction on it, then the probability that there'll be an error on that entangled state is the probability of logical error. And that is going to be smaller than px. That'll be, you know, proportional to px squared. So that is the difference between the two. Okay. So now I can summarize. So this was just an example, but we can basically summarize this whole, um, we, we, can, we can summarize uh, or I can outline how any general quantum error correcting code works. So the idea is that you take many physical qubits and encode a logical qubit, oh, sorry. You take many physical qubits and encode a logical qubit in some big entangled state of those physical qubits. So, you know, the zero logical and one logical state will be some big entangled state. Uh, now we assume that there's gonna be some local uh, errors, uh, uncorrelated or you know, only slightly correlated errors happening on these physical qubits. Um, so th those local errors is not going to completely destroy the information in this uh, superposition state. That's, that's the important uh, point. But these local errors basically will take you to an orthogonal subspace. Uh, and the way we choose these two subspaces 
uh, is that we, 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 we choose a set of operators, which we call stabilizers, and the, the code space, the zero and one logical states are the plus one eigenstates of these operators called the stabilizers. Whereas the error space uh, is, it, uh, so, so the errors that we want to correct are the anti-commute with at least uh, one of the stabilizers, so that when you go into the error space, and if you measure the stabilizers, the error space will be minus one eigenstate of at least some of the stabilizers. So if you measure the stabilizers, if all stabilizers were plus one, you know you were in the code space. And if some of the stabilizers were minus one, then you know you were in the error space. So you can get these error syndromes out. You can decode at those, on those error syndromes, decide what errors happen and where it happened, and then you can uh, recover your information. Now, you just don't want to correct for errors that happen directly on the uh, data qubits, but you also want to be able to correct for errors that happen anywhere in the circuit you're building. So, you know, even, even the act of measuring for these stabilizers will require you to do some gates, do some measurements, and those gates can be faulty and the measurements can be faulty. So if your error correction code is able to uh, correct for er errors, even in the gates and the measurements, then it's called a fault tolerant error correcting code. And just like a uh, classical threshold theorem, we have a threshold theorem for fault tolerance, fault tolerant quantum error correction, which says that as long as the error rate per time step uh, or per gate operation is below some constant value, then I'll be able to execute an arbitrary length uh, quantum algorithm uh, uh, with, our, with a desired degree of precision. And this, this value, uh, below which your error rate has to be is called as the threshold. Now for the condensed matter theorists in the audience, there's actually a very interesting, uh, uh, there's an interesting connection between the, the threshold and a, a, stat mech, a classical stat mech system. You can actually map the noise in the quantum uh, code to a disorder in an equivalent stat mech model. Uh, then the threshold actually becomes the phase transition uh, in the STATMIC model. So the phase transition between the order and disorder phases in the STATMIC model. That act, if you calculate that point of phase transition, it's, it's like calculating the, the threshold. And the process of decoding is equivalent to calculating the partition function. Um, so so I, this, this is a very interesting connection and actually a lot of thresholds uh, for many uh, topological codes have been calculated using this, this relation. Now I'm gonna very quickly tell you about one of the most popular error correcting codes out there, uh, which is the surface code. So in the surface code, uh, you take many physical qubits arranged on a 2D lattice to define a logical qubit. And you have two types of stabilizers, the X stabilizers and the Y stabilizers. So these four body, the, the, these X stabilizers are four body X operators acting on the four qubits around the blue plaquettes. Uh, and the four body Y stabilizers are the four Y operators acting on the four qubits around the green plaquettes. And then at the boundaries, you have the two body X and Y stabilizers. Now, the X and Y stabilizers will de can detect for all X, Y, and Z errors. So if there's, there's no error in the system, if you measure these stabilizers, all of them will be plus one. But if there is an X error, for example, at the center here, you, these two stabilizers will become minus one uh, because X anti-commutes with the Y stabilizer. And if you get this measurement outcome, then you know that there was an error here and you can go fix it. And how do you actually measure these stabilizers? You actually put another Encilla qubit out there. You prepare the Encilla qubit in some state. You do a bunch of C0 gates between your data qubits and the Encilla qubits, and you measure the Encilla qubit out again. And the state of the Encilla qubit actually tells you what the value of the stabilizer was at that point. Now the nice property about the surface code is that it's it's a 2D code. You you know you don't have to everything is in a 2D plane. Moreover, it has one of the highest thresholds so far. So if p is the rate of uh, p, p is the rate of an x, y, or z error uh, in in the physical qubits and physical gates, um, and the, and the threshold for the surface code is about one percent, then the probability of the logical error in this lattice is going to be p over p threshold to the power l plus one over two, where l is like the size l is the size of the lattice. So the bigger lattice you make. Uh, the smaller logical errors uh, you can get as long as P is below this threshold value. 
So just to give you an example, if you wanted to factor the 2000 bit number, um, the, your target logical error rate was about 10 to the minus 12. And say your physical error rate is 0.1%, the threshold is 1%. So if you put numbers here, you'll see that you need a 20 by L equal to 23 by 23 lattice uh, to make the logical qubit. Uh, now, if you increase the threshold by two, uh, somehow if you were able to increase the threshold by two or decrease the error rate by a factor of two, then for the same size of lattice, you'll achieve much lower logical error rates. And in this case, for example, you can um, uh, you know, find the ground state of this remote molecule. So that's, that's the nice thing that if you start with really good qubits that is start with a smaller P or you know, manage somehow, can, can you change the surface code to get a higher threshold, your code just becomes better. So our, our aim that, that, that we're trying to achieve in, in uh, Yale, for example, is to use a very interesting qubit, which is a qubit encoded in an oscillator to implement uh, the surface code in a much efficient manner. So, we find that you, you'll see, it, I'm gonna show you some examples of these qubits that you, the, the, you can do some uh, active, you, you can do some local uh, error, you, you can provide some local error resilience to reduce the value of P itself in that formula, or you can use some other properties of these bosonic qubits to actually increase the threshold. And therefore you can get improved error correction with these bosonic qubits. So let's talk about qubit in an oscillator. How can you encode a qubit in an oscillator? So rem remember, um, the idea of quantum error correction was that you needed a large Hilbert space to encode, you know, uh, just one bit of uh, one quantum bit of information. But if you look at a harmonic oscillator, uh, the harmonic oscillator has many energy states, and now you can access all of these energy states, and you can use some, you, you can use some. Uh, complex non-classical states of this harmonic oscillator to encode a logical bit qubit of information. So in case of qubits, we think about it as many body entangled states where we are storing information, but in terms of oscillators, we are storing it in some non-classical state. Now local errors in, these, uh, in, the, in the qubit case becomes low weight errors uh, in the harmonic oscillator. So by low weight errors, I mean, uh, just like a single photon loss, single photon gain, you know, a little bit of dephasing, and so on and so forth. So now, if 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 you have access to non-classical states, and if you have low weight errors, then you can use the same trick to do error correction directly in a single uh, harmonic oscillator. The idea is the same: that you get two subspaces, a code space, and an orthogonal error space. Uh, you define some stabilizers. You measure the stabilizers to detect for errors. Decode. Uh, the measurement results and uh, you know apply some correction operation. The, the problem though is that, well, the problem and the solution is that you cannot control a harmonic oscillator. Like you can't even, how do you even prepare a non-classical state in your system? Well, you need some, unharmoni some unharmonicity somewhere. So in, in our uh, superconducting circuits, this unharmonicity comes from the Josephson junction. So instead of using Josephson junction as a qubit, we, will, we use Josephson junction as a control uh, to make the qubit inside the harmonic oscillator. So we have sort of interchanged the role of what is a qubit and what is a control. So let's have a quick, um, uh, let, uh, you know, some, some uh, quick introductory uh, quantum optics uh, so that I can tell you about what these uh, non-classical states of uh, photons are that we are going to store information in. So the simplest uh, state is a coherent state, which is the eigenstate of the photon annihilation operator. And here I'm showing you a Wigner function. Uh, so the x-axis or the i-axis is like the position and the q-axis is like the momentum. And the Wigner function of the coherent state is just a blob at plus alpha. Um, sorry, it is a blob at plus alpha. And in this case, um, I'm choosing the, I'm choosing alpha to be real so that this blob appears at q equal to zero axis. And the coherent state minus alpha is the minus alpha eigenstate of the annihilation operator, and it's represented by a plot at uh, it's represented by a blob at minus alpha. Now you can also have a superposition of these two coherent states, which is the cat state. So you can have an even superposition state, which is represented by this uh, Wigner function, and the odd superposition state, which is represented by this Wigner function. 
So now what you have is two blobs at plus and minus alpha, but you now get these interference fringes at the center, which tell you that it's a quantum superposition state. So for the even superposition state, you get uh, the interference fringe at the center has a positive peak uh, um, at the middle here, at the zero, zero point here. Whereas for the odd superposition state, uh, the interference pattern has a negative peak at the center here. So that lets you recognize whether it's an even uh, superposition state or odd superposition state. Now let's look at the states a little bit more carefully. If I plot the uh, photon number distribution uh, of the of the of the um, the cat state plus, uh, then you'll see that it has only odd photon number states that are occupied. And if you look at the photon number distribution of the cat state minus, then you'll see that it has only odd photon number states occupied. So therefore, this is also called as the even parity state, and this is called as the odd parity state. And if these two are the orthogonal states. Uh, clearly, they're orthogonal. Um, and if you wanted, you could use you, you use this to store. You, you can use this these two states as your qubit states. Now you can also rotate uh, these states by a phase pi over two in the in the phase space, and you get another even parity and another odd parity state. Now, if I take a superposition of these two even parity states, I'll get a state which is uh, which has only photon numbers at zero, four, and eight. So uh, we call it the zero mod four cat because uh, if I divide the photon number by four, the result is zero. And uh, if I look at this superposition, it's uh, it is the um, um, odd. So and if, if I if I look at the other superposition. Uh, it can have, uh, it, it's called a two mod four cat because it has only states, photon number states like two, six, uh, 10, et cetera, uh, that will be occupied. So photon number divided by four is going to give you a remainder of two. So now these two states are also orthogonal and you can store quantum information in this and this is called as the cat building. Now, let's see what is the most likely error that happens in the system. The most likely error is actually a single photon loss. So if you have a single photon loss, then this state, the zero mod four state, actually goes uh, to the one mod four state. Um, so it goes to, sorry, it goes to the, yeah. So, so it'll have only uh, uh, three, seven, et cetera, photons. And, and a single photon loss in this state will go to the other, uh, so sorry, this is a three mod four and this is a one mod four state. So you see that you, if there was no error, you were either in the zero mod four or two mod four states, but if there was an error, you go to the three mod four or one mod four state. And if you're able to measure uh, the um, photon number parity, uh, that is whether you went, you, you were in the even photon number parity state or an odd photon number parity state, then you'll be able to detect whether this error happened or not. So this allows you to do some local error correction. So these, if, if you choose these two to be the logical states, then these are the two error states that can happen. And if you measure the photon number parity, you can detect whether that error happened or not, and you can recover the states. Now there'll also be some other errors in the system like two photon loss or photon dephasing. These are in our superconducting cavities. This is much, much less likely than the single photon loss events. Um, and so we have to, you know, uh, so the idea is that you correct for the most likely error and uh, uh, to correct for the remaining error, then you can put it in the surface code. Uh, so just to tell you that this is uh, not some just, you know, crazy theory idea, this has actually been done in experiments. So you can measure the photon number parity using a dispersive coupling between your, between your Josephson junction or the transmon. And your, and your cavity state. Um, and in our superconducting circuits, this, this sky is, can be very, very large. Um, it can be about 1,000 times larger than the typical decoherence times. And so you can you know, really perform many, many error correction steps uh, before the information is lost. So here I'm taking a plot from this uh, uh, paper here. Uh, so let me explain what this means. So, this green, this green line here is basically the lifetime of um, uh, your, your Josephson junction. So, you know, if you initialize the state into, uh, you initialize your, your transmon qubit in some state, uh, this is how fast, it, it, you know, the information is lost and it becomes like a mixed state. Um, 
then this uh, gray light, uh, the gray, the gray line uh, is if, if I just uh, encoded information in the Fox state zero and one uh, in the cavity. So this is, this is the gray line is actually just telling you what is the rate of single photon loss. So here you see that the rate of single photon loss is about 300-ish microseconds. It's, it's, about, it's about 20 times faster than uh, the, the rate at which information is lost from this transmon k -red. Now what we do is uh, we then prepare our uh, the, the SCAT code in the cavity, but we don't yet do error correction on it. So, so in that case, you get this, um, this yellow line over here. So I'm not doing any error correction. I, make the, I just make the CAT code and, and let it sit there. And not, not surprisingly, because the CAT has more photons than you know, the Fox, the, just a single photon Fox state, it decays faster than this gray line here. Now, when we do active error correction, lo and behold, uh, we get this red line. Uh, so this yellow line becomes a red line. So we have actually increased the lifetime of our uh, CAT code by actually doing error correction on it, measuring these stabilizers and you know, applying the correction operation. Uh, so that, so, and, and the, the slope of this guy here is uh, 318 microseconds, which is slightly larger than the, uh, the DK time of the cavity itself. And so what we have done is we have reached break even. That is our encoded information does slightly better than the best qubit in the, un, the best unencoded qubit in the system, which was a Fox state. Now this blue line here uh, is actually when there, there are some errors that can transfer from the transmon to the, um, uh, to the, uh, the, the, there's some errors in the transmon which can limit how this red line, uh, how, how much improvement we can get, but we can, some of those errors we can detect. Uh, and, and so the blue line is like a heralded, like if there was an error in the transmon and we could measure it, uh, then we, we get rid of those numbers and we are able to improve uh, this line even further here. So really we are able to do error correction. And this was the first, uh, this was the first demonstration of break-even uh, in any, any quantum error correcting system. And this was done with our bosonic qubits. So as I said before, we need to do some, we, we still have some errors that remain, that need to be corrected. Um, and, uh, and those, those can be from, you know, the two, the two photon loss events or dephasing events in the cavities, or they can also come from the, um, uh, they can also be induced from this, this non-linearity that you're using to control your, your system. Uh, so now what we do is we, uh, we can now build the surface code with these bosonic qubits. So now each of these, you know, cartoon qubits are replaced by, by this bosonic uh, system here. And whatever the remaining errors are can be co corrected by the surface code. But what is the point of doing this if I just wanted to use the surface code at the end? Well, the point is that because I started with a better qubit, because I did some local error correction and increased the, the lifetime of the qubit and decreased the, the physical error rate P, now for the same size lattice, I'll be able to reduce the logical error rate. So that is that is the point that you do some error, you do some active error correction locally and then concatenate it to a bigger code which can correct for the remaining errors. Now you can also have a more complicated, even more complicated states. So the CAT states in this CAT code, you got a superposition of four states in phase space, right? Alpha minus alpha, I alpha, and minus I alpha. But you can get superpositions of many more coherent states, like 36 coherent states. And that basically gives rise to this, uh, the, what is known as a GKP qubit. Um, so this is the, uh, a cartoon Wigner function for what the GKP qubit looks like. It's clearly amazingly complex uh, Wigner function, highly non-classical. And these states have also been made in superconducting circuits and they have been made in, in trapped ion systems as well. So in trapped ions, you can use emotional degrees of, of freedom as the oscillator um, and you know, use, use, use that to encode your, your bosonic qubit. And they also, uh, in this paper here, they also demonstrated uh, this GKB qubit. Uh, so the, the nice thing about GKB qubit is that if, if your air correction circuit is perfect, then you can uh, suppress all errors. Like you can suppress for any, any single photon loss, two photon loss, everything 
you know, which ma ma maps onto bit, bit flips and face flip errors, all of these errors are going to be suppressed. So in, if I had a perfect error correction circuit, I would not really need a surface code on top of the ZKP code to correct for any errors. But in reality, what happens is that your error correction circuit is not perfect because you, you're using this external uh, nonlinearity to control, uh, oops, sorry, you're using this external nonlinearity to control, you know, prepare and, and measure the stabilizers for the GKP code. There are some errors that get transferred from this system back to your, um, uh, back to your, your harmonic oscillator modes, and those become uncorrectable errors. And uh, for that, we still need to uh, now put this GKP qubit in the surface code. And so there's, there's some, um, uh, some theoretical work that shows that there's, there are advantages to do this. And again, you know, to me, one of the biggest advantages is that you're starting with a better qubit. You basically correct as much as you can uh, you know, in, in this setup itself. And then whatever small number of remaining errors are there, you put it in the surface code and reduce the errors even further. Now, as I, uh, you know, I've told you a couple of times now that there are some errors that are, that are transferred you know, from this system back to your oscillator. So one of the questions that I was interested to answer was this, this guy here itself is an anharmonic oscillator. So can I take this anharmonic oscillator and encode a bosonic qubit in the anharmonic oscillator directly so that I get the advantage of a bosonic qubit, but I also get the advantage of anharmonicity. That is, now I can directly control the system without requiring any external, you know, non, uh, external coupling uh, modes. And that actually, the answer to that question was yes. And what we found was we could engineer a cat qubit, a two-legged cat qubit, not the cat code, but the, but the regular uh, two-legged cat, uh, cat qubit in this nonlinear oscillator by Hamiltonian engineering. So if you look at the Hamiltonian of this uh, nonlinear oscillator, it looks like this. So the first term is the frequency term and the second term is the current nonlinearity. Now, what we do is we drive the system with two drives, which are equally red and blue detuned from the center frequency. Now, because of this four wave mixing, you will take one photon from this drive and one photon from this drive and convert it to two photons in the, in the nonlinear mode. So you get this two photon drive here. The phase phi is just some phase of the drive with respect to some clock sitting in your system and omega q is just a frequency. Now, it turns out that in, in superconducting circuits, um, you can do something a bit more clever. You, you have something called as a snail, which is made up of four Josephson junctions. It's, it's, a, it's a asymmetric Josephson junction device. Uh, and in this asymmetric device, you both have three wave mixing and four wave mixing. So in this case, you just need to apply a single drive at two omega q to get this two photon drive here. Anyway, so um, let's look at this Hamiltonian because it's kind of neat. So, now, if you go in the rotating frame, you get rid of these frequency terms and the Hamiltonian becomes, uh, reduces to this, which is a time independent Hamiltonian. Um, and you can factorize this Hamiltonian in this form. Uh, now, I'll make a small, so you, you'll see that there'll be two coherent states, plus minus alpha, where alpha is square root of this guy, which will be destroyed by this term here. And these two, two coherent states become the degenerate eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. That means that they're even and odd superpositions, which are the cat states, are also the degenerate eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So lo and behold, I've created, I've engineered a Hamiltonian whose eigenstates are the cat states. So if I choose the phase phi of the uh, phase phi of the drive to be zero, then alpha is real and your cats are along the, the x-axis or the position axis of the phase space. And if I change uh, the phase to say phase phi equal to pi over two, then because of the square root uh, factor, the, the cats rotate in phase space by an angle of pi over four. So in fact, you can just rotate the, the phase of the drive and get different cats if you wanted to. Um, and Anyway, so, but, but we, we're going to define our qubits with the phase phi equal to zero. So this is the block sphere that we can now use. Uh, the cat states plus and minus are along the x-axis of the block sphere. There are superposition states, which are approximately the coherent states are along the z-axis of the block sphere. And this is the other axis of the, this is the y-axis, which is the parity less cat. 
On the right here, I'm showing you the eigenspace structure of the Hamiltonian in the, from the previous slide in the rotating frame. So in the rotating frame, um, as I said, the cat plus and cat minus states are exactly degenerate. They are separated from the rest of the Hilbert space by an energy gap. Uh, the energy gap increases with the nonlinearity uh, and the number of photons. Uh, and, and this gap is what lets you define the qubit because now you can apply a drive to selectively manipulate the state of your qubit in, in the cat subspace without leaking out. So that the nonlinearity that we needed for control is present in the system automatically. So in, in our superconducting circuits, this gap can be very large, about 10 to 200 megahertz. So you can do really fast gates about 100 to 1,000 times faster than the typical decoherence times in the circuit. Now, like the CAT code or like the GKP code, you can't do error correction directly on the system. This, the, you, you can't directly make a logical qubit out of, out of just this simple two-legged CAT. The, uh, the interesting, uh, I'm sorry, the animation went the wrong way. Uh, I'm sorry about that. But, but the interesting feature about this CAT is that the engineered Hamiltonian is actually automatically correcting for one type of error. So because of the, the way we have engineered the Hamiltonian, I'm not going to go into details. If, you, if you're interested, you, you can look at our theory paper here. Basically, the en so you, you can have errors like plus going to minus and minus going to plus. So you can have a uh, bit flip, uh, so, so you can have phase flip type of errors. That is, you're messing up the phase information between the plus and minus states, but the, the, you, you cannot have an error like a bit flip error. Like you cannot go from this state to this state or the zero state to one state. These errors are actually exponentially suppressed. And this happens because of the way this, because of this Hamiltonian that we have engineered uh, to make this gap. So such qubits are called as bias noise qubits. Uh, that is they have one, uh, one error is a dominant error and the other errors are suppressed. In our case, the other errors are exponentially suppressed and we can define a bias, which is the ratio of the probability of a Z error or the most likely error divided by the, the non-likely errors. And this bias actually exponentially increases. So in our circuits uh, for you know, reasonable cavity, uh, for, for reasonable junction parameters, you can expect to get uh, really high biases of about 1000 to 10,000 for a CAT sizes of about five to 10 photons. Um, so, the, so again, uh, these CATs are not a uh, theorist's um, fantasy. They have been realized in our superconducting circuits. Uh, the, the paper came out last year in archive and it was published uh, this year in Nature. And so this is the system where they actually prepared the CAT. This is you know, the, the Josen junction circuit, the snail that, where, where the CAT actually lives. Um, and they actually experimentally did see this bias. Um, that is when you make this Hamiltonian engineering, you're able to suppress um, uh, the error. So here you can see that uh, if you initialize your states along the Z axis, they live for a very long time. Of course, along the other axis, they decay fast, but if you initialize the states along the Z axis, then they, they, they decay, you know, they, they take a very, very, they live for a longer time. And in this case, they saw a bias of about 50. I have not gone into the details, but we have also shown how you can do single qubit and two qubit gate operations. In fact, one of the two qubit gate, gate, gate operations is kind of important uh, if, if you want to use this to make better surface codes. Um, and that's actually a topological gate that happens in this system. Uh, they have all, in, this, in this paper, in, in the experiment, they also demonstrated uh, the single qubit um, gates that we you know, theoretically predicted. And now they're working to do this topological two qubit gate that, I'm, that I was telling you about. So why, is, why do I care about this bias noise qubit? Well, remember I was telling you that when I was making a bosonic qubit, there were some errors that were being transferred from this junction back into the system. But it turns out that if you now replace this with our Kirk, uh, with our cat, the, the bias noise cat qubit, then you don't have that back propagation of errors. So you can, you can use that to measure, like use that an, as an ancilla to measure the stabilizers of your bosonic system without having any back action. Moreover, recently there has been some theoretical work to show that if you have bias noise, then you can take advantage of that bias and make a much, much better surface codes. That is surface codes with higher thresholds. 
so um, we 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 then you know we started to work with uh, with, with these guys who developed these uh, these tailored surface codes for bias noise qubits, and th there was one ingredient that you actually need to make to take advantage of the bias, which is that topological gate that I was talking you about that, that I was telling you about, and the topological gates right now is only possible with, with bosonic qubits. So anyway, so what we did was took their code and we, we calculated, you know, what the threshold should be. So what you do is you simulate uh, the surface code for different size systems. You look at what is the logical failure rate um, for different size system as a function of your cavity or your system parameters. And they all intersect at one point and that gives you the threshold. So for example, in this case, the threshold that we found was about 6%. So this is really high threshold. This is we have really improved the threshold of the surface code just because we have bias noise qubits. Uh, so just to tell you a bit more about what this point really means, it means that if you say if you had a kernel linearity of about 10 megahertz, which is what we have in our setup right now, then to be below this point, uh, you need to have a lifetime of the cavity to be better than 64 microseconds. In the current experiment, the lifetime of the cavity is about 15 microseconds. So we're not really far off. We need just a little bit of improvement to actually be below threshold and really see the advantage in quantum error correction. So this is my last uh, slide where I wanted to summarize our, our, uh, our approach um, to, 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 to build a universal fault tolerant quantum computer. So, you know, we first have this physical layer. We want to have this physical layer with semi, uh, corrected, you know, either error protected or semi-error corrected bosonic qubits. Basically, we want to, at the bottom layer, we want to correct errors as much as possible. Then we want to concatenate it with the next layer and correct whatever remaining errors are there. Up till now, I've only talked to you about, you know, building a quantum memory, but we can also extend this analysis to do all the logical gate operations in, in your error correction codes. And then finally, when we have, you know, so by, by, by sort of co-designing these different layers, uh, we'll be able to reduce the overheads for quantum error correction and really now be able to do, build a full quantum co computer to, you know, tackle uh, important problems like factorization and so on. So I'm gonna stop here and, and uh, leave you with my, collab uh, with my collaborators. Um, so my, my you know, uh, thanks to all the, um, the bosonic error correction team at Yale. Uh, they're, they're, I've only listed the PIs here, but of course, everybody else as well. Um, uh, my collaborators in Sherbrooke, Chicago, and uh, the, the service code team uh, in, in Sydney and, and elsewhere. So I'm gonna stop here. Okay, well, thank you very much for a very interesting and very clear talk.